Good evening, everyone. We are ready to get started. It's, I feel it's such a shame to interrupt this beautiful bird call on such a beautiful spring night. My name is Edward Wolcher. I am the curator of lectures at Town Hall Seattle, and I am so honored to be in this community and welcome you to this very special live edition of Bird Note tonight. Woo. Town Hall is so honored to be one of the producers of this program tonight. I want to be very brief and just thank all of the presenters who made this possible. Of course, KNKX, who are here, uh, the Seward Park Audubon Society, Sasquatch Books, third place books who have books for sale in the back over there, and of course, Bird Note itself. This is a real treat for us. Town Hall is presenting this as part of our arts and culture series, as well as our Town Green imprint of programs, which is an interdisciplinary series of programs on the environment and our relationship to it. It's a real treat to be able to be partnering on this program, which so exemplifies those values of place, identity, nature, animals, and our relationship to them. This is a perfect fit for Town Hall's program. I do want to acknowledge, of course, we are not at Town Hall. Our historic building just down the hill is still undergoing renovations. Thank you to our community who helped us raise over $22 million to do that major renovation of that space. <laughs> We've got a couple last gasps of campaign left uh, to make sure we can reopen in style, so keep an eye out uh, and, and keep supporting us as we return. Uh, we'll be back there early next year for more programming, but in the meantime, we're so happy to be presenting at beautiful spaces like First Baptist Church here tonight and presenting such wonderful programs as Bird Note. Uh, I should say that the Town Green series is supported by the Wincote Foundation Northwest and the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Foundation. So that is all from me. Keep in touch with the things we're doing at Town Hall. The only thing I want to make sure I put in your ears is our Pollinator Week keynote, which we just announced, which will be happening in mid-June. If you love birds, you might also like bees. And that's a really fun annual program we host in conjunction with The Common Acre, a wonderful environmental organization in Seattle. That'll be in mid-June. You can see that and many more programs on our website, townhallseattle.org. Uh, but now, without further ado, I want to turn it over uh, to the good people at the Seward Park Audubon Society who will help set up the program on tour. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Joey Manson, and I'm the center director at the Seward Park Audubon Center, and we're celebrating our thank you. Uh, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. So you, you know, months ago, people said, "Oh, hey, what are you going to do to celebrate your 10th anniversary?" And so I figured we'd have a day of celebration and kind of invite people around the city to enjoy what's going on with birds in Seattle. And I went online to try to get the domain birdday.org and it was gone. <laughs> so instead of having one day of celebrations, we're having a week-long celebration, and that's the origin of Bird Week. <laughs> so we really wanted to have a celebration that would invite the most people across the city to engage in things that allow them to celebrate birds. And so we have birds in cinema, we have birds in books, we had birds as mascots of some of our favorite teams in sports. And we all have special stories about birds, whether it's the crows doing strange things in your backyard, the owl that you hear in the middle of the night, or the song that enchants you as you try to go to sleep. Um, to put this together, we decided to partner with our great friends at Seward, uh, excuse me, Seattle Audubon, the folks at um, Seattle Parks and Recreation, the tremendous work of the people at the Seattle Public Library, and of course, Bird Note. And so we thank them all for participating in this event. <laughs> with, this, with this Bird Week program, what we try to do is inspire people by asking the question, how do you celebrate birds? And different organizations and different nonprofits lifted, the, their, lifted up their hands and said, this is what we want to do. Like right now, you could go to Top Pot Donuts and get a bird nest donut in celebration of Birds Week. <laughs> and I think that's a great way to, for more people to participate in this. So Bird Week is coming to a quick close, but it's still not quite over yet. This coming Saturday, with the help of Seattle Parks and Recreation and volunteers at the Seattle Audubon, what we're going to do is go birding for free 
in 10 different parks across the city. You're gonna have veteran bird guides out there having a fun time bringing more people into birding. If you wanna sign up for these, go to uh, bird, birdweek.org <laughs> and you'll find the, the link and you can sign up for these free bird walks. Uh, the weather will probably cool down a little bit but you can join us. We kind of have like a really fun time to start a bird walk. You may think that you have to get up at like 7.30 or so to go birding. We pushed it back to 10 o'clock, so you can, get a, you, you can get a third cup of coffee and still get there on time. So we hope that you will join us out there at Jack, uh, at Jack Block Park, at Seward Park, at Discovery Park, at Lincoln Park, and so many other parks for these free bird walks. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Michael Stein, who will be your MC for the evening. Folks, I'd like you to welcome my partner, Mary McCann. My name is Michael Stein. Nice to meet you. Barbara Drew. Can I just say something? I, I, I have a script here, and I'll, I'll start reading it in a bit, I promise. I'll be a good boy. I wore a coat. I got a haircut a frickin' day ago. <laughs> oh, hated to give that up. My wife loved the long hair, but no, you gotta clean up. But I wanna thank you, every person here tonight. Bird Note has been around 10 plus years, and it's a wonderful to get to be a part of your life when you get up in the morning, or should you choose to do it online. Mary and I are so honkin' grateful. So please, can I have a round of applause for you? That's why we're here tonight. I would also like, before I read the script, to show you something. David. David did a beautiful photograph for us. We did a uh, little show a while ago about a young man who took some pictures of birds and he made prints and sold them at his family's regular coffee shop to give all the money to Bird Note to keep the show going. And he made his little sister contribute too. <laughs> and they're here tonight, here in the front row. Devise, if you wouldn't mind standing up for just a sec to take a bow. He made a print for us. We're going to hang this in the Bird Note studio. Can you tell us where you got this picture? At Featherdale Wildlife Park in Sydney, Australia. Dude! What? That must have been a good time. Yeah. It's a southern cassowary. It just walked right up to me and stood still as if it was posing for me. What? What's that? It was so cool when I got to see it face to face. He looks pretty pleased to see you too, man. <laughs> the future of birding is all of us sharing this together. Thank you, Debbie. I get to keep that, right? Folks, you are raising your kids right. Thank you so much. All right, now to the script. For heaven's sake, we've dawdled long enough. All right. 
did we get a chance to go downstairs and uh, meet Tama, the Seahawk Hawk? Come on, I can't hear you. Come on, football enthusiasm. Seahawks! Ah! Tama was a little tired. She was at the uh, draft. We didn't do much as Seahawks, but uh, Tama was there. Thank you. All right. So, if you haven't had a chance to say hello to Tama yet, you can go downstairs after the show. Trainer uh, Dave Knutson is going to hang out for a little bit longer. He's got some interesting opinions about the coming year. Be sure to grill him on that. Plus, oh yeah, we have a book out. It's a really good book. What's interesting is my mom all of a sudden took my bird note involvement seriously. <laughs> book? Oh. Something to talk to her friends about. All right, well, bird note founder, Chris Peterson and writer Todd Peterson will be signing copies of that book downstairs as well. All right, so before we get started, here's the uh, fine print. You should know Bird Note Live is a special collaborative project in celebration of Seattle's first bird week, first ever. I think that deserves a round of applause. The birds would applaud. Thank you. We've only been here a few thousand years, thank you, Bird Week. Bird Note, Seward Park Audubon Center, thank you, Joey. Town Hall, Sasquatch Books, and our media sponsor, uh, KNKX 88.5 FM. Thank you. Totally. They'll all be downstairs as well, including the... Uh, Guru S of promotion, Brenda. All right, so support for Bird Note Live comes from Audubon Park Wild Bird Food, family owned, Feather Forward for 60 wild years. <laughs> Feather Forward! Ah, reminding all of us that spring is when newly nesting families need nutritional help. Ain't it true? Spring, man. Info on this and why bird feeding runs in families is online at audubonpark.com. Now, guess what? We're broadcasting tonight's conversation live on Facebook. We're hacking all your data. Woo! But with love. And YouTube and recording it for our latest extended podcast. Thank you. We don't hack your data at BirdNote. After the conversation, we're going to ask all of you uh, to join in, too. Uh, if you don't mind, now, we are doing a live radio tonight. So that might mean, you know, somebody goes on a little too long about stuff. Or we muff it, and we might need to recut a line to make it sound slick and smooth, like, wait, wait, don't tell me. <laughs> so if you don't mind, at the end, we'd ask that you hang with us for a few minutes. We'll make it real clear but just to recut a couple lines if we have to. Is that all right? Thank you for covering our butts. Appreciate it. All right. Just one more thing. When Mary or I raise our hands, because, you know, we are doing a, a live radio theater, and believe me, and wait, wait, don't tell me, when they go, here's Peter Sagal, Right? And people go, what do they do? Ah! They applaud. So we're going to ask you to do the same thing. <laughs> we won't say, here's Peter Sagal. But we'll say, <laughs> we'll just raise our hand. So let's try it, if you don't mind. We'll raise a hand. We'll make it real easy. But it'll make it sound great. Because after all, I wanted to mention, our engineer, John Kessler, wanted me to point out, there's a microphone on stage right and stage left, so we actually are all in this together. You're going to be on the radio, and we appreciate it. So, if you don't mind, let's try it, right? We'll do the easy signal, hands up. So, applause when the hand goes up, if you don't mind. Thank you. This is Bird Note. Oh. Oh. 
Ah, you are beautiful people. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Just to be sure, this is Bird Note. Ah. We are among friends. Wonderful. All right. It's going to be fun tonight. Tell you what. Barbara. <laughs> Drew. Mary McCann. Take it away. The show begins. This is Bird Note. <laughs> Thank you. I'm your host. My name is Mary McCann. And you may have heard that 2018 is the year of the bird. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about birds a lot. If you're like me, I'm sorry, <laughs> birds have absolutely captured your imagination. They're ephemeral. They are incredible. And they are with us everywhere we go. Now that it's springtime, they can even wake you up with the morning chorus. We're live at Town Hall. Birds need our attention now, and they have never needed our attention as much as they do now, and our love more than they do right now. So live at Town Hall, on John James Audubon's 233rd birth anniversary, we're asking, what is it about birds that moves us so? Why do they inspire us? What do birds have to teach us? And what do our relationships with birds tell us about ourselves? Joining me tonight are two inspired storytellers. Meet Dr. Drew Lanham, distinguished, I'm gonna give you a second for applause, distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson University in beautiful South Carolina. Yeah. yeah. And a member of the board of the National Audubon Society. He's a poet, a writer, a photographer, and a storyteller, a storyteller, passionate advocate for birds and people. Drew, welcome to Bird Note Live. Thank you, Mary. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Barbara Earl Thomas is a Seattle artist and storyteller renowned for her sensitive, rich explorations of our shared human experiences. Barbara, it's, it's really great to meet you. Welcome, I'm, I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you for joining us. And in, in just a little bit, we'll meet another next generation of birders, a 14-year-old Seattle birder named Doria Cottle Simon. And uh, yeah, so we'll have her out a little bit. But first, we want to uh, pry the brains of our wonderful guests today. Uh, Drew, I'd like to ask you first, what is the year of the bird? What is the year of the bird and what does it mean? Well, Mary, this is 2018. Take it back 100 years to 1918. A uh, seminal year in our history, World War I was ending. Sadly, we were celebrating or mourning the loss of another species in Carolina parakeets. The good thing that happened for birds in that year was that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed. And so this is an act that protected birds. This was a treaty between countries. There were no walls to say that birds couldn't come and go. And so we began to recognize the importance of birds as sort of emissaries of uh, of freedom, of liberty, 
and, and some sort of, of conservation ethic. And so we come forward to 2018, and it's appropriate that we celebrate that 100th anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which was seminal in our conservation ethic as a nation. Now that act has undergone some changes mm -hmm. recently. But the year of the bird is, is a year for us to recognize the roles that birds play in our lives ecologically, psychologically, physically, in all sorts of ways. And so they're in our lives every day. It's our connection to wildness and to other things. So welcome to the year of the bird. <laughs> Barbara, you often reference birds and nature in your art, like in this work called A Walk in the Neighborhood. That's not quite it. That one not oh, okay. <laughs> called a, this one called a, a Walk in the Neighborhood. And what is it? What is it about birds, particularly? I know you have a love for, for all living things. And uh, what is it about birds that really resonates with you? Well, first of all, let me say, I definitely don't know the stuff this guy knows. <laughs> but I'm here to kind of represent the every man, the every woman, because everyone is not going to be so absolutely scholarly, you know, have that much acumen as Drew. And I am here to talk about the fact that the year of the bird, the day of the bird, the minute of the bird is right now. And when you wake up in the morning, people say, what, well, what's, what's exciting today? I said, I wake up in the morning and I, the first thing I hear is a, is a chorus outside my window. And sometimes it's so loud, I just go, all right, already, all right. <laughs> and what it means to me, it's, it's a metaphor. It's, it's a metaphor for everything. It's a metaphor about being fragile and strong, fragile and strong. It's also a metaphor for me th that has to do with the fact that um, when you're in the studio, I'm an artist, I'm in the studio, and one of the things about the creative process that is so amazing, when you get to that point, you have that moment when you forget about yourself and you're just working. When you look at the bird and you're not thinking about yourself, when you're not thinking about whatever it is in the world that is bothering you, but the fact that this is representative of my life and we are connected. So I like to see myself in the bird and the bird in me. And that's what the every day of the bird means for me. And, I, and that's what I try to, when I tell my friends, I say, what are you doing? I said, I'm going out to look at birds, you know? <laughs> Just going to stand around, look at the birds. And they're kind of like, is it an African-American thing? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, all depends on the bird. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would like to think that um, Drew said something in, 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 in his comments earlier about how we make community. Sometimes you make community not by focusing on yourself, but on something that is mutually important to everyone. And so I feel like the bird is a symbol of, of a place where we can come together and care about something that if it does not exist, that reflects on us all. So that's the year of the bird. Drew, you have said before, People are part of nature, but not apart from nature. What are birds telling us about ourselves? Well, as, as Barbara said, birds are, are really, they're, they're representatives of, of other worlds, really, that, um, that are part of us. You know, they ply the skies untethered in ways that, that we can't, unassisted at least, and so, and so birds really give us this sense of the ethereal. You know, angels have wings, right? And so we, we think about what birds do up there, out of sight. You know, and I always think about this time of night again, that, that birds are thinking about these faraway places. 
and in days, mere days, there will be in the Arctic or someplace else that they weren't the day before. And so that's, that's an important thing, that sort of uh, transference of space and time that we can't exactly fathom. And so birds are applying their lives in the skies above us while we dream. And I think that's important. Birds are dreams. Birds are our dreams. They, they always have been. But in, in the tradition of, of, of so many that have recognized that birds are also barometers of our environmental health. So the canaries in the coal mine, right? You know, understanding that metaphor of, of coal miners going down into the depths of the earth and taking a caged bird with them, a canary, taking that bird with them, and then when the noxious gases became lethal at lethal levels, the birds would stop singing. It's time to come out of the mind. And so understanding that when we aren't awakened by that dawn chorus, as Rachel Carson uh, speaks to us in, in Silent Spring, that something's wrong, that dreams die. Langston Hughes. Yeah. Without dreams, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. So thinking about that, I think, um, puts, puts birds in a different realm. And as much as I love other animals, all other animals, that, that birds are, are special to us in that way and they tie us to something different that sometimes is hard to explain beyond feathers and song. And I think that's important. The inexplicable is what birds bring to our everyday lives and I think we need that. Uh, yeah, lots of room for the inexplicable. <laughs> There's a lot of that. I had a bird land, I was you know, meditating outside and I had a little chickadee toss on my hair. I felt like, like an angel touched me. You know, they're, they're wonderful. Now, um, but I wanted to also respond to, please. to, to, to Drew's um, comment about dreams, because I think that part of why I've probably been so attracted to birds is because in the way I grew up, there used to be, when we'd be in my house, and all these people who'd come from Louisiana and Texas and Florida and Arkansas, and they're all living together in these houses together, and there would be this lore that if someone in the family dreamed about a fish, it meant somebody in the family was pregnant. <laughs> and so in my artwork later on, I put in a bird delivering, such as the Annunciation, the fish to the people. And I used to be terrified by these, this, this lore because I didn't know if you got pregnant because you dreamed about the fish, <laughs> <laughs> or if the fish made you pregnant. So what I prayed for was not to have any dreams about any of those things. <laughs> and so um, this is, you see that, that the piece up there, you see the, the fish, the bird delivering, it's delivering the dream. Mm. And so it's just a little, you know, kind of tied to our own sort of mythology and then taken into the mystery of how people try to explain the world to themselves. And then if you have confused children like me, you, <laughs> you just um, ex believe everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a wonderful example of how um, our lives and people and of birds are intertwined and really cannot be taken apart. And I think that that comes up in your work quite a bit, Barbara, that uh, those stories, those long stories, that you can't, you know, oh, that's, boom. You, you can't, I'm, and also I think that, again, it gives people a way in, and it's um, symbolic. You see also the fish are under the bed. I don't know if you ever had those dreams when you got in your bed. You didn't want to hang, hang your hand over the side when you're in the bed, because you never know what's gonna suck on your fingers. <laughs> Come on, you guys, you know that's what you thought. <laughs> and so I still like to think about those things that terrorize me and then the things that come to redeem me. And I think of birds as a little bit of redemption. And I think we're all trying to figure out how we are going to find redemption in the world where we're always having to come up against something and try to forgive ourselves and forgive others forgive ourselves, forgive others. So I think of the bird as being sort of that peace offering and why birds 
so often show up in artwork in that way, the dove delivering the sign of peace or that we found land or that kind of thing. So I think having had that kind of growing up, those things are stuck in my head. So um, they're still there. <laughs> and they're getting out all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. Uh, this, this is a piece of Barbara's work called A Dream Delivered. Dream Delivered. And uh, linoleum. It's walk. a li lino cut. Lino but cut. again, it's, it's not that people have to know those stories, but because I know those stories or those are part of my, my lore, I like to work them in. You know, I like to have it be something that I think about that allows me to have kind of a matrix to hang something on. And I think that that's the way the, that aviary kind of spirit works for me. And if I'm ever distressed, I just go outside. And one of the things that happened, someone asked again in, in the earlier, um, when Drew was speaking, like, what's your favorite bird? And I happen to love the cedar rack waxwing. That happens to be one of my oh, favorite yeah. birds. And so they never normally have come to my neighborhood on Mount Baker. And finally, I was looking out my window upstairs in my back window, and I saw Cedar Waxwing on Hunter Boulevard. I was in my pajamas. I ran out of the house, and I <laughs> dove into my neighbor's shrubs. <laughs> and then my neighbor, who was a very sort of Be elegant guy, he goes, he steps out, he opens the door, he says, Barbara, I said, get back in. Cedar Waxwing! <laughs> and he goes... <laughs> don't you know? Yeah, and so... I don't, he never asked me about that day. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, now, this, what we have here is definitely a bird-friendly crowd mm -hmm. in the house. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> but you... Drew are maybe the first birding rock star. He's a rock star. Yeah. I'm sitting next to the rock star. R&B hip hop. <laughs> well, and uh, well, you're a naturalist, a professor, a writer, a hunter, a outdoorsman, and you're even on Bird Notes board of directors. <laughs> Proud of that. Why are you so captivated by birds? You know, again, it, it goes back to that first fascination with flight, right? And I, and I count Wiley Coyote as one of my mentors. Uh, <laughs> because every Saturday, Wiley Coyote would get it wrong. <laughs> and, and I figured that I could get it right. So, you know, so that was, um, that was sort of this first exposure to, to what birds could do that I couldn't. And, you know, and that's, that's important, and there was always this effort to be a bird. And, and so for me, again, it's sort of reaching beyond and understanding. And as you, you know, you understand the science of birds, and, um, you know, I take those deep dives into who it is that they are, and I keep, and I've changed, and I used to talk about birds and what they are, and, and, and what they are is, you know, is obvious, but I think for me, sort of this transference to who they are in our lives is important. And, um, and, and so that immersion for me in flight was, was critical and, and growing up in the country as I did, you know, those, those birds gave me a, a vehicle to be in other places. And so when I began to, to, to study who birds were and, and to understand sort of this this magical ability that they had to traverse the world. You know, that, that there were birds that I would see at certain times of the year and then they would disappear and, and, um, and I would open the bee encyclopedia, that bee volume of Compton's Brownback 1966 version, <laughs> you know? There was no Google, right? I couldn't just um, punch a button and the birds be there, but I would look at these birds and there were maps. And maps have always thrilled me, and there would be drawings, these diagrams and arrows showing birds going from North America and close to places where I was in South Carolina and going into tropical forests, and some birds going almost to the South Pole, and then some of those birds going almost to, 
you know, the place where Santa lived and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, that, that to me, it gave me a vehicle to understand the world. And, and I think that's the importance of birds that, you know, a southern cassowary, right? Can, can look us in the, in the eye and, and give us some sense, a different sense of who we are. And, and I think birds have the capacity to do that. They have the capacity, it's why so many people feed them, it's why people sort of personalize them, it's why people begin to, to take them in, in in ways that maybe they don't um, take other creatures in. So that's an important aspect, I think, and, and for us to care about birds, to have some personal attraction and, and empathy, maybe, for, for who they are as, as creatures that are fragile and strong, that are resilient. Think about that, how resilient birds are, that all of the struggles that they go through in a migration from tropical rainforest across from the Yucatan, imagine this jump for a yellow warbler, let's say, 600 miles from the Yucatan Peninsula to the Gulf Shores nonstop. You know, you imagine that overnight, and then some bird shows up in your patch, your backyard, to sing this sweet song, and just imagine that one bird and what it's gone through to be in that place. You know, and that evolved capacity that shows up in that bundle of feathers is a miracle. At that point that that bird sing, that sings that song, to you, that you can personalize, that you can call your own, that maybe your neighbor hears in a different way or doesn't, but, but that to me is, it, it, it makes birds special, each bird special. So, you know, I, I tell people nowadays that my favorite birds are the ones with feathers, and, um, <laughs> and I do have favorites. I love cedar wax wings. But, um, but, but it's, it's important for us to take birds in on an individual basis. And I, I think that's a lesson for us as humans. You know, that each bird is somehow special. That if, if you truly, if you take a moment to really look, watch a pigeon fly, watch that bird fly. And you know, you've got these canyons of concrete and steel that that bird flies through. Um, it's hard to dismiss that ability to do what that pigeon does. So again, it's, you know, that started <laughs> in part with Wile E. Coyote and wanting to fly, but then it just became my way to see the world beyond that. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and that, that's, you know, just like birds, you know, all of us humans have the ranges that we go to, the paths we take in our migrations throughout the day, throughout the year. We have different plumages. <laughs> we have different, <laughs> we have different plumages and, uh, and songs. We all have our own particular song for, and songs for when you're hungry or when mating or, you know, where you're just kind of looking out for all the other birds and you're the watchbird. Um, are, we, are we bound by these things? Is this some kind of, is this, is this how they reach out to us? Uh, or do they only reach out to us if we decide to accept what they're giving? Well, I mean, I feel like when I'm, I always try to remember that I'm not real for the bird in the same way the bird is real for me. Mm. And um, the bird isn't there for me, because of me, about me, which is to me the metaphor, you know, that um, my really dear friend Ruth Kirk talked about. She just passed away a week ago. And we were going down the Grand Canyon together and she said, you know, if we spoil this one wonderful place and time that we have, the mountain doesn't care, the bird doesn't care, but we spoiled it for ourselves, and the bird doesn't know. So when I think about the bird, I feel like they're going to adapt in a certain way that I probably won't. <laughs> and yeah. and um, I was gonna say, the first time I ever realized that there was anything such as a birder, <laughs> I actually didn't know because I watched the Bob Cummings show. Uh, 
and they'd have that woman with that that thing around her neck, and she would always go the yellow belly cuckoo. And um, but I was in actually I was on Cozumel um, on the island, and I came out of my room, and there were these people in the bushes, <laughs> and all I could see were their legs. <laughs> and I thought, what? are they doing? Is that kinky or what? <laughs> and so I went back in. I said, okay, well, everybody does this thing. And then I came out the next day, very early, and they were again in the bushes. And finally I went up. I said, what's with this in the bushes thing? And they said, oh, you know, in Cozumel, there's only these special kind of birds you can only see here. I said, yeah. And we flew here to come see that bird those birds, oh. and that was, I think I, I was in my 30s then, and I had no idea that people did that kind of thing. And I said, I can do that, it hurts nothing. <laughs> and I always like to do things that I think don't hurt anybody or anything else. So that's when I started looking and going into the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> And the bushes are better for it. Well, the bushes, you know, I mean, all you can say is your friends kind of talk really slow to you if they think they're really, hi, Barbara, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, so is this, uh, this, this vision and inspiration and, uh, you know, like, maybe not even a knowledge, but an observation of what birds do and what they are in, you know, just in your yard, outside your mm -hmm. window. So is this, uh, is, is, you know, this is a great way for us to get information about how the world is. And I think, and, I, and again, being that, that you're every man, every woman here, so okay, I just go down to see Joey at the you know, Audubon. I said, I'm going to have bird feeders. And so there's nothing like just going down to say you're going to have bird feeders to find out about wildlife. So I get all these bird feeders, I put them out there, and okay, the birds start to come, but then the squirrels come, and then the raptors come, and then the rats come. And I'm in my studio, and I, I just happened to look over, and I saw, I have a very small yard, and there were like, I said, I, I don't think I'm into all this animal husbandry. <laughs> and so I had to walk back a few steps to figure out like, you know, what was I intending? <laughs> And you learn a lot about the connection between and among um, a wildlife. You know, when you put food out, it's not just the bird that's going to come. It's not just, you know, your house finch and your goldfinch and your whatever. Everything comes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I had to kind of figure out how to sort that out. And um, I haven't sorted it all out, but <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a learning process. So, um, Drew or Barbara, so is, is this a learning process somewhat of a liberation? Do you have to be, you know, do you have to have that spark when you see the birds, you know, to, to, to hear that story of liberation that they carry, or? A spark, you know, that. In the, among birders, that's a word that we use to, you know, we talk about a bird that's, uh, that sparked our imagination, that somehow inspired us, that got us started doing what we do. And, um, and you know, you have to have that initial spark, maybe, of some bird um, that, that just gets you, just grabs you. But then, you know, it's, it's sort of a daily thing, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of a, a daily thing that some bird grabs you. I mean, uh, s some days it's, you know, it's the new bird that's come through and migration. But some days I just decide I like cardinals and I want to be with cardinals all day. You know, and, and it's, it's kind of this lesson in, in redness. <laughs> and, and, um, and that there's variation in redness. Right? Yeah. So, you know, so those individuals that, that are out there, so the spark is, th that's the wonderful thing about birds is that the spark can be different each day, or maybe it's the same bird. I've been fixated on a loggerhead shrike because of an incident um, that I had with white-crowned sparrows where someone wasn't kind to me in watching those white-crowned sparrows. And so I had to change my range from the patch 
where I had watched white crowned sparrows when someone was unkind to me in a, in a very deep way. I then found a place to watch birds thinking I was going to find more white crowned sparrows in that habitat. And there in midwinter was a singing loggerhead shrike. And, and loggerhead shrikes, you know, um, they, they aren't common anywhere now, really. They're a declining bird. But that loggerhead shrike, to me, in my mind, in my writer's mind, and having been displaced from a range watching birds that I had come to love, those, that flock of white crowned sparrows is one of the most reliable in South Carolina. And I would sit sometimes for hours watching white crowned sparrows, you know, hearing that. Just listening, right? And someone's mean to me, and then I find this loggerhead shrike, and the shrike is singing, right? The shrike is singing, and that shrike seemed to me really some sort of metaphor for acceptance. Now, that shrike, <laughs> you know, um, didn't know who I was, maybe. <laughs> but you're a rock star. <laughs> um, I, you know, to that shrike, and to, I'm, I'm just a guy, I'm just, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a guy who loves birds. And in that shrike, in that moment, um, I became fixated on it. And I would go to that same patch um, when I would come home, if I had been traveling, you know, I would, I would tell my wife Janice, I would say, I'm going out to Pendleton to watch this shrike. And nobody understood this shrike. Why are you going to watch this bird? But that bird, when it would appear, get, did something for me did something for me. So whether the bird knew it was or not, it did. And that's important, you know, and, and it's this sort of selfless thing. So sparking can be this diversity of birds, you know, it can be art, it can be sort of any, any given thing. But I'm, I'm grateful for that bird because in a way, in that small instance of that unkindness of a person around birds that I love to watch, mm -hmm and then being displaced to this other place where this loggerhead shrike is there, it, it, it was, it's really been very emotional for me. And so quite honestly, as the shrike left, as I knew it eventually would, uh, you know, I miss it. I miss that bird. And that's, it's okay to miss birds. It's, it's okay to personalize them. You know, as, sci as a scientist, we'll, we'll always say, don't anthropomorphize. Don't do that. Don't make those birds into humans. And, and I don't try to do that in any sense, but I, I try to let myself be into that bird and at that level. So I like to think about absorbing birds. I like to think that birding is more than just listing a bunch of species, that birding can be your relationship with birds. It can be your relationship with the natural world. It can be your relationship with something beyond you. So that spark for birds, for me, has become a very personal, sort of spiritual, sort of internal thing that I love to share, but sometimes it turns really inward for me, really inward. And that Shrike and I have a relationship. I'm sorry. <clears throat> you know? So there we go. I'm stuck on the Shrike. <laughs> well, I think that, um, again, in, in being sort of in the city mostly and probably not out in the, the country looking at things, I, I try to make the most of what I see every day in my city and what's here and also remember that for people who aren't here, these birds are rare to them. And so I try to keep in mind that for for the crow or the red-winged blackbird or the cedar waxwing that I see, they are rare for other people. And so, but I have my personal relationships. I would run down from my house on Mount Baker and I'd run down to sort to run along the lake and I'd come down off the hill and I, this is, and this is how you learn that there are other things in the world other than yourself. I must have run right under a crow's nest. <laughs> so I come down off the hill and all of a sudden, I hear this thing go thunk. Oh. 
And I think that a kid has hit me in the head with a basketball. And just as I'm looking for the kid, I see the wings kind of take off from the top of my head and it's kind of grabbing my hair and kind of pulls me up a little bit. And so I just take off running. And I just start running wildly and then I run up on this woman and I grab her from behind. She thinks she's being mugged. <laughs> and I said, did you see what just happened? Did you see what happened? Did you see that? And she goes, well, those kinds of things happen sometimes quite often. I said, oh, you're worthless. And I just <laughs> took off. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to outrun this crow <laughs> if it wants to get me. Right. <laughs> it took me about three minutes to figure that out. And um, so my lesson from that was that when I would come down the hill, I'd always wear a hat. So when it would so go they wouldn't to, recognize you. And I also <laughs> thought, I thought, well, you know, it's there. And they, the two crows had a conversation. They said, we're nesting, and there's some nesting material. And we should go down there <laughs> and get that nesting material and then bring it back and put it in the nest. And so I just had to figure out a way to discourage that behavior. <laughs> well, you, you, you've written that in every human encounter. There's, that there's really a chance, an opportunity for a real human breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And in that sense of connecting, of sharing, and mutual recognition, literally, for the crows. And um, do you think birds can help you know, just people in general with that connection? Or do you think you have to have a, is it like a moment that can come across someone? My husband never, never really noticed a bird until he met me. He, you know, unless he parked under an apple tree, you know, in the well, summertime. <laughs> you know, it, it's that 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 personal connection is is important. And um, you know, as, a, as as birders, as a lot of us are out and we're identifying, you know, wing bars and and and, and tail projections, all that stuff that that we do. Sometimes it, it's important to just sort of be with that bird, whatever it is. So, you know, one of my, you know, my, my new rules for birders is the birds don't really care if you identify them correctly or not. <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> so in, in that sense, Mary, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, you know, part of, of, of what we do as birders and, and we sort of reduce by body part and then to, to bring that bird back to who it is. Um, you know, I like to, to teach birding by gestalt. That means by feel. And so, you know, you get this, this feel for that crow, even though you can't see all the feel marks or, or whatever, or whatever bird that it might be. But, but then, um, you know, I think to expand who we are as a community, that, that we really need to be inclusive, you know? And, and, and that means in lots of ways. That means in, in, in how we look and how we think, um, how we feel, you know, about the world. As long as we care about the world and wanna move it forward in positive ways, I think, you know, we ought to work towards bringing those people in. So I tell folks, a birder for me is someone who appreciates birds you know, that, that they can appreciate birds and, and on some daily basis, on some regular basis, may not be daily, some regular basis, they recognize the importance of birds in our lives. And, and in that, you know, it really expands the breadth of how we can be and how birds can be important for us. So, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're connections to humans all of the time and on a, a, a daily basis, you know, one of my mantras is everybody has a bird story. Even if it's the chicken leg you ate last night. <laughs> People sometimes forget that, 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 that chickens are birds, but uh, you know, again, <clears throat> you know, sort of the, the, the gloriousness of birds, of you know, seeing a soaring eagle and it's sometimes easy to, to begin to put birds into these classes. And we always have favorite birds, but as long as you connect in some sort of way, you know, and as Barbara connects through art and, and, and all of these different ways, you know, it, it, it brings to my mind just, and, and I think about my grandmother, how she connected to birds, and she would say, I pity the birds, the, the winter birds, and she would throw out grits, perfectly good grits that could be boiled. <laughs> uh, but she would throw those grits out for the birds, and that was the first person that I ever saw feed birds. 
you know, and she didn't, she called them snowbirds. She didn't know they were juncos. <laughs> it didn't matter <laughs> to her. And so, and, and, and so that's one of the things that I would like for us to do sometimes as birders, loosen up a little bit, <laughs> you know, and if someone, if, if someone misidentifies a bird, guess what? In order for them to misidentify the bird, they had to be watching the bird in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, come back around, you know, let's have a conversation about this bird. And guess what? It's amazing how people begin to, to talk themselves into this kind of relationship that, that leads them to maybe become better at identification, maybe they don't, but they're still watching that bird. And at the end of the day, to have somebody appreciate that creature who then says, wait a minute, I heard about a referendum that they're gonna take that park out? They're gonna remove that green space? Man, there were a lot of birds there. I don't know what kind of birds there were, but there were a lot of birds there. I don't want that green space to go, so I'm gonna go to that town council meeting. And they go to the town council meeting and they can't identify a single bird, but all of a sudden they're activists and they're saying, no, don't take the trees. You know, it's, and it's a bunch, it's a community of Loraxes. <laughs> and, 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 and people are speaking, you know, they're speaking for sneetches and, and, and all those imaginary things. And then all of a sudden, guess what? You're a different kind of community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I sense, I really sense that's what's happening here. You know, I sense that's what's happening here. Because you could be doing a lot of other things tonight. But that, that you care enough to, to come to a place and be sparked by a bird and have it somehow do something in you that means that you want to take the time to talk about it, to care about it, moves you to a different level. And so I applaud you, Seattle. I applaud Washington State. I applaud any place, Barbara, that takes the time to care enough to, to, to just love nature and love wild things. And so birds give us that. So applause for yourselves. <laughs> this is Bird Note Live. I'm Mary McCann here with Drew Lanham and Barbara Earl Thomas, our wonderful guests. And I'd like to follow up on a very personal kind of story that humans tell, the stories that we share with our children, the lessons that we can learn from them. So welcome with me to the stage, Doria Cottle Simon. Welcome, Doria. Uh, Doria is 14 beautiful years old and already a passionate birder and an advocate for the outdoors. And uh, we have a, you have the herring gull. Beautiful slide. And uh, Doria, welcome to the stage and welcome to the evening tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Is it true that your very first word was bird? Um, not quite word, but I learned uh, sign language before I could speak, and my very first sign was the one for bird. All right. So, <laughs> pretty similar. Oh, uh, so, uh, so ASL, American Sign Language? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm not as good as I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's actually an old uh, uh, top 40 hit from that. The bird, 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 that the bird, bird is the word, that the bird, 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 bird is the word. Everybody's talking about the bird, but everybody knows the bird is a word. <laughs> uh, so, Doria, what is so interesting to you about birds? Oh, that, that is a good question. As, as a general rule, I'm a pretty scientifically driven person. I'm the one that'll probably ruin any joke with actual <laughs> scientific facts. Um, but with birds, there's, there's answers to that, like, you know, scientific proof, but then there's just some part of them that's so otherworldly that's, like, no human could ever fully capture and understand. And it's entrancing, really, that 
there are these, these things that exist so commonly, so just everywhere, and yet there are so many things that we could never see level with them. And it's amazing, really. Wow. Um, now, Seward Park is a very special place to you, correct? Yes. Uh, it's a very special place here in Seattle. Uh, so what makes it so special for you, Doria? I've, so I've lived in Seattle most of my life. I say most because we travel, so really all. And Seward Park has always been, you know, 10 minutes away. And it's, when I was younger, we'd go there and just, you know, take rocks. I'd throw rocks into the pond or lake trying to skip but never really and it as i grew older it slowly became more and more present and important and now i mean i i volunteer there during my summer i go there quite frequently and it's it's just always been there i guess it's amazing what a beautiful what a beautiful resource to have at your really hands, and, and and what a great mind for you to see that, and to you know, and to and to really bring it in, bring it into your life every day. So you're in eighth grade, correct? Correct. Alrighty, um, you're part of the Seward Park Audubon summer camp, and then you became mm -hmm. a volunteer at the summer camp, yep. which is a great way to to just head up the ladder of birds, I guess. Uh, you know, a lot of kids spend their summers, you know, complaining that they're bored or just hanging out. But you would go back to bird camp. You would go back to bird camp every year to volunteer. Why was that? Um, well, first, Barbara just asked me, bird camp, it's the summer camp, or what we call the summer camps there at Seward Park. And it's, it's really amazing, actually, if you have uh, kids that, and you live in the area, you should try to enroll them because they fill up pretty quickly. But um, it's, they're, I mean, there's summer camps, but we go out and uh, into the forest, Seward Park, and uh, do, I don't know, various activities. There's sometimes like a mini owl prowl where you'll see fledglings of the barred owls that live there. Or one week we actually saw five woodpeckers in two days, which was pretty yeah. amazing. And... There, there are each camps for more specific things, like more artistic approach, more wilderness things, but all in all, it's, you know, connecting, you know, children with nature, I guess, in positive connotations. Now, I, I don't imagine a lot of children are out birding. So do you have friends that do that, or do you feel like, oh my gosh, it's just me and the birds? Oh, no, I, my friends just kind of look at me like, oh, okay. You, you do you, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, but, I mean, as far as I know, no one else in my school really is, is into birds. But, I mean, if you are, you should come out of hiding because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go to camp. <laughs> Go to Spirit Park. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I, I, Mary, I wanted to know, Doria, I, because we were out in Seward Park yesterday and Joey led us on a walk and Maggie was there and some of the staff, and we found a place where owls are coughing up pellets. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to do any of the uh, pellet dissections? Or? <laughs> um, I have. That's actually one of my favorite uh, things that we do at the summer camps. <laughs> um, Everyone who works with me and has been with me knows I get a bit too eager about them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing doing that. Uh, I, I have a, a friend in Arizona who avidly collects them and takes the, bo bur the bones and things that they find and makes jewelry. Oh. Makes really cool jewelry. I need some of that. <laughs> I'll hook you up. Same here. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing what you find. So you, so do you find any friends online who are like a, a peer of your age? No, no not no. really. My only... <laughs> <laughs> my, my only online presence is really that of uh, the artistic kind, so... That's good. 
<laughs> That's good. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Drew, what do you think our kids are going to need so that they're, they're not burdened by themselves? They're not, you know, well, how can we do, what can we tell the children to bring them in? Or is it, uh, you know, how are they, how, how can they better connect with birds? I, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, and, and Doria talks about having that first connection of, of skipping stones or trying to skip stones, you know, and, and that's important. And, and that time, wherever you are, um, that, that you find nature in something, you know, and, and part of it is, is the wildness experience and finding wildness where you are. And, and so redefining that in ways. You have this wonderful old growth forest here in Seward, but for, for some folks, and you recognize that, that wildness may be a small patch of green somewhere. And wildness is, is, is something beyond your control, something outside the bounds. So exposing um, kids to that and giving them opportunities and not teaching fear, not teaching fear um, and, and allowing kids to get their hands dirty and to throw rocks and do those things. Those are, I think those are, they're, are important. And it, you know, for some people will latch on to birds, some people will latch on to binoculars or, or, or and, 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 and they'll get it. Other people will find butterflies, other people will find boulders. And to me, it's just critical that people get out, yeah. you know? And, and so that if they get out, that, that birds are a wonderful conduit to, to care, but I expanding beyond that, you know, birds need trees. Birds need soil, birds need water, just an air just like we do. And so for children to understand that we have that common shared cause, and, and, they get, and, and they'll get that, you know, and they begin to get that early. And, and seeing yesterday at, at Seward, seeing a, a young lady she couldn't have been she couldn't have been any more than maybe three and she was she was touching the birds and she was touching the feathers and her mother um and and these were children of color and her mother did not stop her from touching the birds um explained to her what the birds were the importance of feathers showed her how the birds feathers grew and that that lesson watching that was brilliant you know, I met a new friend tonight, Luba. Where's Luba? Is she here? Luba, Luba my, my new bird friend, her favorite bird is a peacock. Um, <laughs> she had on a little peacock dress. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, ee -yah, ee -yah. <laughs> you know, that's what peacocks do. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so she's connected. Right. And, and her parents have, have let her connect to that bird in that way. So... You know, I think for, you know, for Doria's example of skipping stones, that's important. You know, we're all born naturalists. Mm -hmm. We're all born naturalists. We notice toes and fingers, light, you know, the senses of however we detect um, what's around us. And so I think it's just a simple, and maybe sometimes not so simple, but, it, but it's really we have to act in ways to push kids away from that sometimes. And, um, and I tell folks, even with technology, you know, if, the, if your first step is to box somebody's phone and say, you can't take that out, guess what? You're going to lose people. Phones have cameras. Challenge people to take pictures of flowers and Snapchat them, Instagram them. Those, look, I'm telling you, it, it's, you know, we have to meet people where they are. Right. Field guides are on phones. Oh, you know, yeah. so... It's, it used to be for me, you know, and I'm, I'm getting to be the grizzled old ornithologist who <laughs> don't, don't, don't take that phone out there. Remember when I was little, we had to run 200 we, miles well, to get we, a phone to take. Yeah, I had to look at birds three feet deep in the snow. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you know, but really technology, you know, is a, is a way to do it. Um, to, to encourage people to say, you know what, you can use this to become a naturalist. And, and um, Joey had his iPad out yesterday, so, okay, Doria, I got to one of your pellets yesterday. I got to one of your owl pellets, and I did dissect it, so you have one less. 
out there. I'll forgive you. Uh, but you know, we found we found the mat, we found a rat skull, a rodent skull. We found um, you know these other bones and disarticulated. But Jer but Joey had his iPad out there with a field uh, dissecting scope. We got pictures of this stuff. And so how are you going to? That's technology. That's meeting. And so all of a sudden, people are entranced. Young people are entranced because they're like, wow. You can do that, and then you get to a spot in the forest where the, the canopy clears, and guess what? You can take that photograph, and it's on Instagram, it's on Snapchat, and somebody's like, wow, what was that? Well, man, an owl coughed this up. <laughs> this is like leftover owl vomit. <laughs> oh, they would love that. that right. Yes. <laughs> so meet people where they are, you know? And, and Doria is a great example um, for for, for going forward. So, Doria, thank you for everything you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbara, do you have something to add on that uh, well, connection? I think, well, I think, again, I think um, Drew said something that was really important about not teaching fear, because I, I actually was chosen to go down the Grand Canyon and so they needed a naturalist, they needed someone that was really famous, and then they needed someone who was scared. <laughs> so I was the scared one. <laughs> but I think that the thing that I do take, even when I go to, to Seward Park, is that it's not a stage set. It's not there as some kind of a design feature <laughs> that's been put there kind of to simulate wildness. It's something that we, our, our forefathers and mothers were s smart enough to keep for us so that we could see, have a little idea of what the rest of the world really looked like before we put neighborhoods all over them. Yeah. And um, so I think that, that that teaching that this is not we didn't, just, this, is a, this is what nature is, and it is wild, and actually there are things you have to be aware of, but there, there's still something for you to discover there. And um, I think that's amazing, and I think that we do sometimes approach the world with the, the parts that aren't tamed and in a package, kind of with fear. Yeah. And um, I, have to rem I have to remember that too. Doria, I have a question for you. Now, if your parents were teaching you, you know, ESL before you could talk, these are some, these are some great parents, <laughs> you know, to have that. And what do you think, you know, you, you, you had a great gift there, you know, as we all do with our parents, you know, it's the hand you're dealt, right? <laughs> and, uh, but how do you think that adults can help kids connect with birds? Um, I feel like this goes for most things in relation to small chi children, <laughs> um, is that, like you were saying, don't associate it with fear, but then also, like, in the natural world, there's something for everybody. There's a field, there's an animal, there's a rock that anyone could find uh, souls of sorts and and like if you're talking with you know like your kid or like your friend's kid or something don't apply a stigma to it I guess because I mean there is not a lot for birds that I can think but like bring them outside point out like any cool animals you see because I've like when you go to Seward Park, there's their own little ecosystems there. Like you'll see these, like teenagers trying to pretend they're not enjoying themselves, and this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> parents uh, trying to keep their kid from eating sand. And there's this, oh god, he has to be at least 90 something by now, kind of you know, quote unquote, jogging about. Um, and there's always these kids asking questions because, you know, they're inquisitive and, you know, answer their questions, open more doors, just, like, don't stop them, I guess. Yeah, yeah, don't stop them. And I think that uh, we see a wonderful movement 
in our young people your age that's, that's going on in this country now, and it's one of the most exciting things I've seen in my lifetime, that, that that's kids standing up and saying, this is important, and they're being heard, and I love that. You know, and I know that there's, you know, grown-ups that don't get it yet, you know, that don't, don't know the name of one tree from another or one bird from another. Um, but great kids like you, you're going to change that soon. You're going to change that soon. Well, our wonderful executive producer is motioning that we just have a couple of minutes left. And uh, I wanted to ask you, um, what is one simple thing, you know, Barbara and, and Drew, what is one simple thing that we can do in our daily lives to connect and c connect with birds, with nature, or, or even just with our fellow humans? Catch a sunrise or sunset. Mm. And I would say, and this is because I am from Seattle, if you can't be kind, at least be civil. <laughs> That's true. So and true. I and I also think that um, say hello to each other. And if you see a bird, just go watch. Did you see that? <laughs> and all of a sudden, someone who's never spoken to you or doesn't know who you are, they look up, and all of a sudden, that's the thing you share together yeah, is having beautiful. seen that bird. And when they see you again, they go like, "Have you seen that bird again?" <laughs> and you said, "No, but I'm still looking for it." And you know, that's what we're, we're looking for, the bird that we see together. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Well, we really have been fortunate tonight to have our wonderful guests. And I would like to uh, thank Drew, Drew Lanham, Barbara Earl Thomas, and our wonderful Doria Cottle Simon. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Bird Note Live. Thank you so much, Drew, Barbara, Doria, and Mary. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're thinking about recording a couple of episodes of Bird Note Live. What do you think about that? Yeah. That'd be cool. I'm, uh, I'm thinking it might be a good moment for a seventh inning stretch. Ooh. Kind of a... Don't look at me, you do it yourself. I'll start. <laughs> All right. So here's how it's going to go. Uh, we're going to pick a couple bird note stories from the wonderful book, which has just come out. And we're going to read them live and ask you to join in. <laughs> and uh, what we need you all to do is help us make the bird sound. So. <laughs> So we'll excuse some of our friends here, except for you, Drew. <laughs> We're hoping you're going to work with us. No bird sounds? <laughs> All right. Drew is actually a well-known bird, uh, bird imitator, as we have heard a little bit. So it'll be great. <laughs> All right. What we're going to do is uh, hear a couple of recordings from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology after we uh, let our guests head back into the uh, audience. Please, yes. Yeah. What a wonderful show. Thank you, Doria. Rocket, Barbara. Thank you so much. Oh, buddy. You and me, buddy. Oh, here we go. <laughs> no. 
Now, as you know, when you listen to Bird Note, right, it's like, where did they get those sounds? And it is astounding. Uh, all kinds of different people. I got to tip my hat to Garrett Vinn. Do you yeah. know Garrett Vinn? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Wonderful yeah. photographer. Yes. 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 New York Times best-selling book came out last year. You, yeah. you might have it. Um, but I was asking him, <laughs> you know, like a tourist, how do you get those sounds, Garrett? <laughs> and he said, well, all right. It, it's a huge variety of ways, but he said sometimes you actually have to go into the field and dig a hole and lay down in the hole for three or four days <laughs> and not move because only then will the birds forget that you've disturbed their scene, right? And it's they'll, dedication. Exactly. They'll forget you were, you're there and then they will come out and act natural. And there's Garrett <laughs> in his <laughs> hole with his camera and his recorder and Big ready to get these sounds for us. It's astounding. So, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to match you against the uh, sounds from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can do it. You can uh, do it. All right. <clears throat> for $100,000. <laughs> now, most of our sounds do come from Cornell. So first, we're going to uh, do the, um, we're going to hear from the Cornell Lab, the barred owl. Our illustration shows the barred owl. I understand you're quite a good barred owl mimic. <laughs> so long, Cornell Lab. <laughs> I was deprived as a child. Yes. I thought you were going to cack out at one of those uh, pellets. Oh! <laughs> That's later. Haven't the done strength. that image. Okay. Yeah. You know, the next time we get together, we've got to bring some pellets to pass around so we can all kind of get a good visual. So, what we're hoping is that you will join us in doing the cry of the barred owl as we do the episode. So, think about that, put it in the back of your mind, because in this episode also there is an American crow. So, let's hear that first from the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. <coughs> Never Never heard that one, huh? <laughs> All right, let's, uh, you ever done that one, Drew? Are my bros. Ah. <laughs> the crow bro. All right. So, what we're going to do is we will be recording these episodes and you will be on the radio in a couple weeks or so when we get to mix them. Thank you very much, Drew and uh, I and all of you on a Bird Note episode. So, what we're going to do is we have a cue from our friend Lisa who uh, is going to be holding up a sign for us. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, Ms. Lisa. <laughs> she's the best sign holder in town. And she's going to give us the cue, kind of a Vanna White kind of thing. <laughs> so what she'll do is she'll hold up a sign when we say, you know, give us your best barred owl. And she'll hold up the sign and say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Oh. And, and we'll ask you to do it with us. So, with Drew, can you do this call with us? Ready? Are we going to give it a go here? Let's do it. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Oh. Oh. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> 
One more time. Little here, 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 from here. All right? <laughs> There you go. All right. Hand. Give yourself a hand. That sounds wonderful. Now, since there's two birds, we got to practice the second call as well, which would be the American crow. So Lisa has another sign, which is, oh, couldn't see that one coming. Drew, would you mind leading us in this one? Somewhere crows are going crazy. <laughs> uh, oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. So you're going to be the Cornell Lab of Ornithology tonight. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Woo! All right. This episode, are we ready to do it? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Here we go. This episode is named The Barred Owl Calls. It was written by Bird Notes founder. Chris Peterson. Yay. Live from Seattle, this is Bird Note. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, barred owl sounds. Mm, they are amazing. Lisa, shall we? <laughs> Who hooks for you? Who hooks for you? Oh. Both male and female barred owls make this signature nine note hoot. These large gray brown owls are very territorial and they don't migrate. So you might hear the same birds calling year after year. Who hooks for you? Who hooks for you? Let's follow a young male barred owl. Through the seasons, throughout the late summer and fall, into winter, we hear only his solitary two-part hoots. Who hooks for you? Who cooks for you all? One day in April, a crow creates a ruckus, dive bombing something in a tall tree. Could it be our young male owl trying to sleep? Crow. In May and June, the barred owl continues to hoot, though less frequently. Now, in late summer, the breeding season for the barred owl has passed. Who hooks for you? Who hooks for you? What is this owl's story? Could he be what some scientists call a non-breeding floater? Is his patch of woods just too small to host a pair of owls year-round? There's so much to learn about birds. We would like to thank Dr. Drew Lanham and our audience here at Bird Note Live in Seattle and ask for one more barred owl call. When it comes to barred owls, there's a lot more to the story. Start on our website, birdnote.org. I'm Michael Stein. So nice, thank you. That is gonna sound good on the radio. Mm. Lisa, you're good, man digging on the signs. Uh-oh. I got a little sneak preview there. I'm thinking some Canada goose might be in the mix coming up. You know, it's funny. Um, we used to live in a certain ritzy neighborhood of Seattle where uh, 
certain element of the population was getting peeved about the Canadian geese pooping in the park. Gifts of the goose. Yeah. And they, they came to the community council and said, can't somebody put diapers on those geese? <laughs> Has that been looked into? No, no goose poop pampers. No, that doesn't work. Fertilizer, really. Ah, you know. there you are. Abundantly so. <laughs> Much. All right. Let's do another episode, shall we? So, put the image of goose pampers out of your mind. <laughs> and, uh, but think of Canadian geese. All right, Drew. Could you tell us what a Canadian goose sounds like? <laughs> All right, now it's your turn to join in. Can you give me your best Canadian goose? <laughs> Man! I feel like I'm standing on the shore of Madison Park. <laughs> Goose poopies on my shoes. <laughs> this episode is called Why Geese Fly in V Formation. And it was written by our wonderful lead writer, Bob Sundstrom. <laughs> Bob has written over 800 Bird Note episodes. And when you say to yourself, wow, how did that story Man, it was great. Bob Sundstrom is, is the man behind so many of them. So can we take a quick moment to say thank you, Bob Sundstrom, for the stories. <laughs> Wonderful. We are in the hands of a good, knowledgeable person. All right. Among the most evocative... This is Bird Note live in Seattle. That's right. Among the most evocative sounds of early autumn are the voices of migratory geese flying overhead. But what about that V formation angling outward like a ship's wake through the sky? This phenomenon, a kind of synchronized aerial tailgating, marks the flight of flocks of larger birds, like geese or pelicans, but is not seen in the smaller birds, like robins or sandpipers. Oh. <laughs> No sandpiper sound effect, sorry. <laughs> Most observers believe there's a straightforward reason for the birds to fly in a V. Each bird behind the leader is taking advantage of the lift of a corkscrew of air coming off the wingtips of the bird in the front. This corkscrew updraft is called a tip vortex. Such efficiency enables the geese to save considerable energy during long flights. It's beautiful. <laughs> Small birds probably don't create enough of an updraft to help others in the flock. Too small so they don't fly in V formation. The V formation can also enhance birds' ability to see and hear each other, helping prevent mid-air collisions. So migrating birds that fly in a V combine the benefits of aerial updraft and communication. Oh. We'd like to thank you for being here and thank Dr. Drew Lanham and our audience here at Bird Note Live in Seattle. Learn more about the aerodynamics of bird flight at birdnote.org. I'm Michael Stein. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah.
honk, honk. <laughs> All right. That was amazing. Hey, now, uh, if you don't mind, um, this is a live taping. So just like Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me or any of the other shows on NPR, um, we're hoping you'll stay in your seat for just a moment or two uh, in case our producer needs us to do any quick retakes to make sure we get the proper sound. So if you don't mind, just hang with us for a moment. We should get it all uh, sorted out. I'm sure we didn't make any mistakes, did we? Oh. <laughs> exactly. Oh! Good heavens! By the way, it is funny because, uh, Mary, I don't know if this is true of you. Uh, do you get asked, what is your favorite bird? I a do. Lot. I do. I do. And I, I, it's got to be the chickadee. <laughs> yeah. I, I love them. Uh, they're, they're adorable. And the more I learned about them, then I really, really, really liked them. Because in winter, they make the mixed species flocks, you know, the little birds kind of all hang together. And the chickadees kind of like the gang leader. You know? Chickadees, like, they look out, you know, and they have a call, you know, where everybody's, you know, everybody's eating, trying to get as much as they can. The chickadees have the whole thing organized. And they're, they're doers and they're, and they're helpers and they're, you know, com community organizers right there, right in front of us. Chickadees. Can we give it up for the chickadees? Chickadee dee dee! Come on now. Chickadee dee dee! <laughs> Well, all right, I gotta admit, when, when I get asked that question, um, blue heron. Oh, yeah. Can you do a call of a bird, blue heron? He <laughs> 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 always sounds so good. peeved, like you're waking him up, and what the heck are you doing? <laughs> but uh, I work at a place uh, in Olympia that's right on the waterfront, and it's amazing because they come down and there is a rookery on the west side of Olympia, 15, 16 nests. It's amazing. Just uh, almost as nice as what's in Marymore Park, right in the dog park there. Yeah. Which is an amazing thing to see. Like, if I was a heron, would I build my nest in a freaking dog park? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they were there before the dog park was. That must be it. But uh, to see them all together like that is, is just astounding. Yeah. And as we all know, herons are very solitary creatures, actually. But for that one part of the time, right, they kind of come together and, and hang out together and look out for each other and... Uh, Make new ones. Mm. <laughs> and it makes me think about us sitting here tonight, man. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I uh, think our producer's saying uh, we're all right. We're good on uh, any uh, things? Well, yes, yeah, st stay in your seats until we're... Do we have anything? Okay, good. Let's do the credits then. Let's Mike. do the credits. Burnout. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's Bird Note Live. We couldn't have done it with everybody here tonight. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause yes. for us for being here tonight? Bird Note Live. My goodness. Thank you again to our guests, Barbara Earl Thomas, Drew Lanham, Doria Cottle Simon. Uh, Bird Note Live is a production of Bird Note in partnership with Seward Park Audubon Center, Town Hall, Sasquatch Books, and our media sponsor, KNKX 88.5 FM. And make sure you stop downstairs, meet Tama the Seahawk. Yes, the Seahawk. Say hello to our partners and staff and find Drew Lanham's new book, The Home Place. And thank you for tuning into Bird Note every day on over 240 public radio stations nationwide, including right here on Seattle on KNKX. 88.5. Hey, can we ask everybody Bless to just uh, stay, 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 stay for just a minute? No? Okay. All right. Producer says no. <laughs> they started the show yeah. back in the day, so thank you so much. It's the Puget Sound at home. For Jazz, Blues, and NPR News, you can find Bird Note on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. Connect with us on Facebook, Facebook. YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Instagram. Right. Go birding in, in a Seattle park this Saturday. It's Bird Week. 
Joey told us about some great events. You can find a guided bird walk near you at birdweek.org. Oh. All righty, yeah. So if you sign up, you can ride a line bike free to the bird walk. Yeah, right on. Thank you. Okay. Seattle loves birds. Thank you, Seattle, for coming tonight. One more round of applause for us here, the fans of the birds at the beautiful Seattle First Baptist Church in Seattle. Thank you. For Bird Note, I'm Michael Stein. And I'm Mary McCann. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Good night. Thank you.